Family, today uh, we're in Acts chapter 6, and uh, it's the life of Stephen. Stephen comes in and out of church history with almost an incredible flash. And so from that, we can simply ask the question, uh, what's a well-lived life? And um, he, will, he will give us, from the character qualities of his life, uh, what is a well-lived life? And let me ask you, what's a well-lived life? That was recently asked uh, of, of a bunch of 80-year-olds. They said, what advice would you give to younger people if, if you had a chance to stand in your position of uh, being on the other side of the hill and looking to someone who's about ready to climb the hill, what would you tell them? And there was a lot of, of humorous ones. I think the top one was, take care of your teeth. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be celebrating too many soup suppers. Um, so, <clears throat> but then there was some truly great advice. And three of them, I've merged into one. It said, marry for love, be romantic. Choose your life's mate carefully. This one decision will, will determine 90% of your happiness or misery. Oh, that's good advice. Uh, another one, be brave even when you're not. Pretend you are. No one will know the difference. The third, be bold and courageous. When you look back on your life, you'll regret the things you didn't do more than the ones you did. So, what do you think is going to make for a well-lived life? Family, um, if, if you and I believe that we will stand before our Savior Jesus Christ one day to give an account. We'll be thankful that we've accepted the, the gift of salvation, but the Bible says we will give an account. What do you plan on telling him? Do, do you have a well-lived life? I wish I could introduce you today to Dr. Ed Klemek. Dr. Ed Klemek was my brother-in-law, Kathy's sister Nancy's husband, um, I, I really loved him. We would, <laughs> we would climb mountains and take pictures of just these little mountain flowers. And then he'd look back with this cheesy grin on his face as if he had just discovered the planet Mars. I mean, he just had a joy in life. Uh, he would be concerned for patients uh, as a pediatrician and would call a mom or a dad and ask if the medicine was taking uh, was taking effect in, in the little child's life. And if it wasn't, hey, come on in tomorrow. I've been rethinking it. I may have some other ideas if it's not beneficial. Uh, in church, uh, he was so committed to the idea that he, uh, the kids needed to grow in Christ. He actually wrote his own Sunday school material for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade kids. Uh, he, he loved the interaction. If they'd accepted Christ as their Savior, he'd have them stand up and, and share their testimonies to all of the kids that were in Sunday school that day. Um, he would have ushers at the door as we do. Uh, he, wanted, he wanted the kids to learn the idea of being a little more outgoing and bold. Uh, he would make them uh, sign up uh, with a senior citizen and interview the senior citizen uh, about life. And then they had to give the report uh, in, in the Sunday school class. Uh, he was just very engaging. If they did everything, memorize verses, accomplish their lesson, do these reports, uh, he would then put them on a train in Chicago and he would uh, then pay for they and a number of sponsors and they would go all the way to Cedar Point, Ohio, was one of the largest amusement parks uh, in the country. And uh, he would take them through all of the roller coaster rides, etc. And that was, that was his way of honoring them for all of their hard work. Uh, he got cancer at 45. And uh, I, I, I led his funeral. And one of the, the worst moments that I can have in that funeral that day was a man was standing right behind Nancy. He was another doctor and he looked over to a, to a third doctor and said, you know, isn't it such a waste to see him die so quickly? Really? His life was a waste. His patients dearly loved him. 
he saw nearly a hundred or more kids that are now in their adult years working out their faith in Jesus Christ all throughout southern Chicago. A, a waste? Really, that's a waste? Um, another woman who was impactful uh, in my, my life, I only met her one time. She was a missionary. Darlene Deibler Rose was her name. But Darlene went out as a 19-year-old missionary. She married a 36-year-old man. She was the youngest Christian Missionary Alliance missionary to go out under their system. Uh, she was also the first white woman to go into an area today we know as Papua New Guinea. Uh, the, the people of New Guinea, the, the, the natives that, that they were there to, to talk to, didn't believe that this white woman was even a, a real human being. Until one day when she was changing clothes, they decided to push over her tent. And because she had all of the same parts and pieces that their females had, uh, they then knew that, oh, she's real. And you can't believe, as, as I tell you this, many of you are going, oh, I can't believe he said that as a preacher. But you need to understand, for them, that made her real, touchable, tangible, and identifiable. And from that, they were able to communicate the love of Jesus Christ. She came out and the Japanese arrested her. And she spent four years in a concentration camp. Her husband died. Um, at, during those four-year period of time, she was arrested, accused of being a CIA spy, and spent 18 months in solitary confinement. Her story is just an incredible thing. If you, have the, if you want, the book called Evidence Not Seen is outstanding. She was about ready to die. She actually had bent over, and the samurai sword had been lifted up when, when bombers flew over. The, the siren came on. The sword was put back in the scabbard. She was taken back to all of the other women who were there that day. And a number of months later, she was freed. Family, she came out of that concentration camp at 86 pounds. Um, she came home to America, <laughs> married a Baptist guy, they went back out under Christian Missionary Alliance to the same area that she was with her first husband, saw and was part of a revival of thousands of, 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 of Danny tribesmen, translated the Bible into seven different languages, uh, and, and then she ended up dying at 87 years of age herself. How do you know what's going to happen in the turn, events, the turn of events of your life? How do you know? And then what's going to make a well-lived life? The person that dies early, was that a wasted life? person who dies late, was that a good life? Well, what if the person dies late and all oh, they have nothing to show for it? Uh, I love John Piper, the preacher, uh, as he describes in his book. Um, the individual who would report to God who retired early and they loved collecting seashells on the seashore. And they report to God and says, what did you do with your life? And they said, look at my seashells. Family, what's it make? What's the ingredients for a well-lived life? Stephen is going to die in his 30s, as we're today in Acts chapter 6. Uh, he's a flash in the pan in history. He's a flash in the pan in church history. But I want you to understand, to a large degree, uh, Stephen makes a monstrous impact. And to some degree, you and I can give him our appreciation when we arrive at heaven. I believe his, his martyrdom was highly influential in Paul. And anybody who will read Acts chapter 7 and then turn around and read Romans chapters 1 through 16 will hear Stephen's words in chapter 7 ringing true over and over and over again. Family, what made his life important? I want you to come with me this morning and, and, and join with me as we look at what the qualities are. It can't be uh, how long we live. It can't be what we accomplished. It can't be how many toys uh, we've gathered together. And I want to suggest to you today that the essence of a well-lived life is what you do as a servant of the Savior Jesus Christ. And the rest is left 
for you. So family, I want to join with you um, as we, we look at parts of this next few passages or chapters in the Bible, and we're only going to read a few verses together. Chapter 6 in Acts, we're going to begin reading at verse 8. I'm going to read down to verse 17, if you will, listen. It says this, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and of those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he was speaking. And they secretly instigated men who said, uh, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Family, there's a lot in here. I won't be able to talk to a lot. Let me just quickly address this face of an angel. Um, when you look at that little cherub four-year-old at Christmas time, and he's sitting there so cute in his red and green, and you say, oh, wow, he has the face of an angel. No, he doesn't. He has a face of a pagan little kid. He just cleaned up good at that moment, all right? This is the only time outside of the person of Moses that looks down and talks about a, a radiance. And so understand, as Moses had to cover his face, the Bible tells us there's a, a radiance about Stephen that's unique. Um, Richard Wormbrandt, the Bulgarian pastor, speaks about times in the concentration camps uh, of the communist regime that had arrested him, saying that some of the men just simply looked different in their times of representing Christ. I don't know what that means, but he says, I could tell they were believers and had the chance of verifying it later. Uh, family, I want to come and, and I want to see some of the things that makes a well-lived life. And I want you to notice in this first point what we want to see life uh, in a planned spiritual confidence. Uh, so I want you to recognize um, that life is living confidently in Christ. So if you will, we want to see five character qualities that Stephen has. Um, and so today, as we look at these five character qualities, I want to challenge you. My, my job here is to make you think. If you, walk out of the, if you walk out of the doors and go, wow, I don't even remember what we talked about today, then to some degree I failed. Or if you've turned your brain off, you failed. I really love it when I watch you and as we talk and every once in a while the head moves like a bobblehead. I like that. Why? Your brain's engaged. Now please listen. I don't even mind if every once in a while you walk out and go... You may find by Tuesday I'm right. I'm okay with that. By Tuesday, you may find that says, oh, I got to go talk to Pete, and you send me an email. You may find that I agree with you. Keep your brain on. Why? Family, these five character qualities are that important. Some of you right now are not living for the Lord. You and I know that. Some of you today might not know Christ as your Savior. That I don't know. And you may hear as we talk about these five character qualities, if you don't know the Lord, you may say, boy, those are really cheesy. And in fairness, 
They're made cheesy to you because we Christians have used them flippantly and without regard to their impact and their potency. And I don't want you to get caught up in the down here living. Down here living is how long you're going to live. Down here living is what you're going to have, what play toys are you going to have, uh, how, how life is, how easy it is. God warns us about that in, in the book of Luke. Um, Jesus is, is giving a parable about a rich man, and it, he says this, the rich man says, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, hey, I've made it. I'm retiring early. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And the things you have prepared, those or whose will they be? So, work success, material gain, long life are, are not the hallmark of success. And so I want you to keep your, your thinking caps on, if you will. The qualities that Stephen possesses that our text tells us about today are faith, wisdom, grace, power, and a filling of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear as they're identified. First in verse 5 of chapter 6, a verse we didn't read, we choose, or they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 8, then says this, And Stephen, full of grace and power, uh, was doing great, and great wonders and signs among the people. Now, family, let me talk quickly. Grace, uh, excuse me, doing great wonders and signs among the people. Let me address that quickly. Um, in the New Testament, the 12 apostles, Barnabas, Philip, and Stephen are the only characters that we have that are talked about as doing signs and wonders. All right, the ability, if you will, to do miraculous things, and they're known for that. Now, I'm not minimizing in any way that God can do miracles. God still does them. God answers our prayers. But these guys seem to have a compliment given to them that's a little different and richer. And I don't want the character qualities that we're going to be looked at to be tied in any way in your mind to these. So I want you to set those aside. Not that God can't do the miraculous, but he gave these guys a little different ability. So I want you to notice first that Stephen has faith in God. Faith here means that you have complete trust in God. He is everything. Creator, keeper, planner. That he has an eternal plan that is absolute. It's going to come about. That eternal plan speaks to you personally. That eternal plan addresses the world corporately. It will come about as he has designed. There is no doubt. Now, the question is going to be, do you have faith? Many of you will sit there and nod yes. Let's have the test. Ready? In 1859... There was a character in history, Charles Blondin. Charles Blondin was one of the first guys to establish a tightrope that went from the American side of Niagara Falls to the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, and he walked it. Now, that was a pretty impressive feat. In the end, he ended up doing a number of things, pushing a wheelbarrow across. It tells us that he took a little stove and cooked a, an omelet in the middle, ate the omelet, and then came back. Very impressive. The, the most impressive one was when he put his manager on his shoulders. A uh, man by the name of, of Harry Colcord. Harry Colcord got up on his, on his shoulders and Charles Blondin walked him across the Niagara Falls. Now I want you to hear what he said. This is Blondin's instructions. Look up, Harry. You are no longer Colcord. You are Blondin. Until I clear this place, 
be a part of me. Mind, body, and soul. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to do any balancing yourself. So he said, first, look up. In other words, don't look at the tightrope. Don't look down. Look up. What you feel my body do, you do. Now, let's remove Charles Blondin for a minute and put in the sovereign God. You got faith? You trust that God's in control? You trust that God's designs are exactly what you need? Are you focused on your fears or do you look up? Family, Stephen was wise. In the Bible, the idea of being wise is a skill set. So if we bring it in today's world, a person would be wise if they were a, a master athlete, one that can accomplish exactly what he designs to do, what she designs to do. You are a master, you're a craftsman, uh, as an engineer who not only can design it, but has the skill set to pull off the design. You, you are wise if you're an artist and by your natural ability can see mentally a task and then pull it off with your artistry, your craftsmanship. So it's a skill set. The Old Testament, two men were designed to, to lead in the process of building the tabernacle. They were known as wise men. So as they were given the designs from God to build the tabernacle, uh, it was their weaving as they instructed it. It was their craftsmanship that engraved it. It was their work in the foundry that formed it. And God gave them that ability. And so wisdom now seems to be tied specifically with a awareness of God and his goodness in life. It's a skill set to Christ and the cross. Listen to how 1 Corinthians 118 addresses it. He says, to those who are perishing, the cross of Christ is foolishness. But to those who've been called by God, Christ is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. Every effort, every strategy of salvation that mingles human effort fails. God says a wise person is someone who understands what Jesus Christ did on the cross and how that impacts them and how that influences them and that that gift of grace becomes a skill set by which manages their life. Stephen is also then complimented with the awareness of grace. He says he was full of grace. And I want to suggest to you it is a, it is a deep, it is a profound understanding uh, of the gift of salvation. And that, that gift of salvation has nothing to do with you. So you aren't living a good life impressing God. You're living a loving life for God. Jesus Christ could be called grace personified. Stephen understood intimately the gift of salvation by Jesus Christ, and he was overwhelmed by that. So a man of grace understands the, the privilege of knowing you did nothing to deserve the salvation that God the Father offered you through Jesus Christ. You don't deserve it. There's nothing about you that will maintain it. As you've accepted it and lived by that privilege, you will not enhance it. Salvation is a gift to you. It is a privilege that you will always have. And it drives and motivates you, not because you have to earn and deserve it, but in love, you just simply appreciate what God has done to and for you. So he also says, that God's power is at exhibit in Stephen. God's power is an observable reality that God is doing something supernatural through his people. 
In other words, this couldn't happen unless a supernatural agent was governing it. And I want to suggest to you that too many times we look at people and we say, well, that's because they're super talented kind of people. Listen to James chapter 5, verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. So family, let's put that in, in context. Elijah woke up in the morning and put his pants on one leg at a time like anybody else as a human being. You and I read the character of Elijah in Scripture and go, wow, what a super talent. From God's point of view, he says, ah, he's just normal Joe. He's just a plain guy. And when you and I are in prayer before God, our prayers are as powerful. Supernatural working through simplicity. Power. Family, that power really shows just how plain Jane we are. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 identifies it, and he calls you and I jars of clay. But we have this treasure, the gift of grace in us as jars of clay. Notice, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Family, I can go to no other place maybe this morning than China. In the last hundred years, we've seen nothing but persecution to the believing community of China. Do you realize that they are in the dawn of becoming the most Christian nation in the world? Starting with the Boxer Rebellion, they began to kill the missionaries that continued under the, the, the regime of Mao Zedong. They were driven out. Christians were killed by the millions. And what did we see? We saw a continued growth in the, in the believing community, in the Christian community. They went underground. In going underground, they began to, to worship. They worshiped in garages. <laughs> they worshipped in homes. They worshipped anywhere that they could have an open, open spot. And what do we see? We just continue to see them grow, continue to be faithful. Uh, and instead of being driven underground and disappearing, we saw them thriving. And today we see multiplied millions knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How did that happen? Jars of clay showed the power of God by simply living out and trusting that God knew what he was doing. Finally, Paul, or excuse me, Stephen had the Holy Spirit in an observable way. And family, that's, that's best, I think, fleshed out uh, and the main evidence of uh, spirit living, being filled with the Holy Spirit is expressing the Spirit's fruit. Now, we all have the filling of the Holy Spirit. We all have it. We know Christ is Savior. But older believers, people who have experienced God and his grace for a little longer time should really show that. An experienced individual should live it out, and so they should see the love of God in us, the joy given to us by salvation, a peace that passes all understanding, a patience, a kindness, a, a meekness, a goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and family, these aren't qualities that are produced overnight. And yet they're done so as we trust the work of Christ in our life. And so we see these works filled out and utilized in the individual, the character of Stephen. And Stephen now is going to talk. Uh, he began and you saw that, that he utilized his talents, his awareness of Scripture, and he began to debate with, Jewish men and women who knew nothing about the Messiah, and he won every debate. They had to turn on him, and they had to cheat, if you will. And they had to lie about what he said, and 
In doing so, he's arrested. He's now going to give us, in chapter 7, a long sermon, one of the longest that we have in all of Scripture. It will not be a defense of himself. It will not be an evangelistic appeal. Instead, he's putting everybody who's just condemned him on trial. But he's not going to do it addressing their bad attitude. He's going to address Scripture. And ultimately, what he's going to do is he's putting those men on trial before the work of God. And God is the one who he is appealing to in light of the actions of these men. So I want you to notice uh, what we can take away from these verses this morning is know God's past active work and be ready to speak to it. So let me back away for a moment. Family, you need to know a little bit of your Bible. It's very hard to, to say, well, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And then say, well, I don't know anything. Uh, the, the other night, uh, Dr. Coy had his first of our Christmas programs. And so his entire ABF group was meeting at his house. And we had a little quiz. And we had to know the 10 plagues of Egypt. All right? Now, if I passed out paper this morning, how, well, how would we do if I asked you to write down and list the 10 plagues of Egypt? I'm suspecting by the quiet stares that everybody's giving that it wouldn't be the highest percentage of victory on my part to pass that test. Now, in fairness, it wasn't that night either. But let me suggest to you this. You should know a couple of things about the plagues of Egypt. Number one, God led every one of them. You should know a couple of them. First, maybe that he turned the blood of the, or the Nile's river into blood and that the death angel came through and killed every firstborn child. Number 10, you should know those things. And out of 10, the nation of Israel walked out of Egypt. God was in control. You should know some of those things. They, they, they come back and they remind us of God's great control in, in the world. And so maybe I'm, I'm already suggesting to you, if you don't know much about Scripture, that you may look at that as an assignment for 2019 as it approaches. Family, know God's past active work and be ready to speak to it. So let me boil down. He has in a message, and it's 50-some verses long. We won't address it all this morning, but I want to give you the boilerplate of the focus. He has three key thoughts here. Number one, God is sovereign and in complete control. Family, the sovereignty of God, the complete control of God, can use mankind's sins, failures, and judgment to do as his will desires. So Stephen paints a picture of God's work with Abraham. And let's remember, God asked Abraham, leave Ur of the Chaldees, leave there the banks of the river of the Tigris, Euphrates. Come, if you will, to the promised land. And he did. And from there, he promises a number of things. Number one, to a man who has no children, I guarantee I will give you a child. And from that child, the stars of heaven can't count your descendants. Secondly, he says, I'm going to give you the promised land. And yet, he never owned a stitch of the property of the promised land, save his burial plot. In the end today, we know the Jewish nation because God gave him that first child, Isaac. God fulfilled his promise and gave him the nation of Israel, the promised land that we see today. So family, God's sovereignty proved to be exactly unfolded as Scripture presents. But then Stephen reminds us of a second great principle. Mankind can only be trusted to fail.
Family, we will not listen absolutely to the will of God. And our leadership will let God down. Read the Bible and pick any of your favorites. Let's come back to Abraham for a moment. Family, what does it say about God's sovereignty in the mind of Abraham if you look down and you remember some of the incidents of Abraham's life? He wives, how about this? As Abraham heads into the, the country of Egypt, he says, oh, hey, we're about ready to meet the Pharaoh. I'm going to introduce you as my sister. Is that okay? What wife wants to be introduced to anyone as the sister of your husband? He does so twice. There were times when Abraham failed utterly, completely. Family, pick out a character in, the old, in, in any of the Old Testament stories. Pick out David. David was considered a man after own heart. Adulterer. A man after own heart. Murderer. Man after own heart. Liar. Family, mankind will always fail and let down. God sovereign, mankind will let down. Notice third, God is too big to be contained in the imaginations and designs of mankind. So he simply reminds them here in the text of Scripture Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? And so he just simply reminded them, as, as the dawn of the Messiah came and is going, if you will, to be offered to the world, well, one location's not going to be sufficient to take care of God. God's not someone you're going to box up in a temple, even though it was a beautiful place. Family, the Jews look, could say, they failed. You know, if I took you to if I took you to Istanbul, 1,500 years later, 1557, Suleiman designs a building, his mosque. He says, I want it to be the grandest place on earth. He puts in it one of the first great domes that has gone in in almost 1,000 years. And you can look up and it goes 242 feet into the air. He designed a place that would showcase God. You're going to keep God in just a bigger box than the temple? The Christian community in Rome, the Roman Catholics, said we want, to make a, we want to make a building that puts Suleiman's in our shadow. And St. Peter's is designed. And its dome goes to, I'm sorry, 440 feet in the air. Twice as big. It's massive in size. Do you really think your God is so small that it's going to find resting place in anything that mankind can design and build? You and I have the privilege of grace. Offered to us by a God bigger than we can comprehend. Through the gift of salvation given to us by the Savior Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and he asks us to follow him. And in following him, we see the development of grace in our life, of wisdom in our life, of power in our life, of faith in our life, of fullness of the Holy Spirit in our life. And he's bigger than anything we can comprehend. So I'd offer you a third piece of advice, and that's simply this. Leave the ending to God. Risk for his glory. Risk for his glory. Don't be satisfied with making a good living. Don't be satisfied with buying a lot of toys. Don't be satisfied by going to the doctor and having one more good checkup. Because in fairness... You may live for a short period of time. Stephen was stoned. Stephen disappeared from history. 
Others will live long lives, and yet they will still disappear from history. But they will be remembered by their impact eternally when they live with the recognition that God is the one who uses them. And God wishes to see his character develop in them. Let's pray. Father, allow us to understand who we are. Dear God, in understanding who we are, we're kids of the God of the universe. And Father, I would pray that you would help those who understand that privilege, that understand that quality, to know what a gift it is. Dear God, it cost everything. It satisfied God the Father to crush the Son. The Son who asked that the cup not be given to him, willingly took it and died on the cross for our sins. And Father, why would any, why would any paycheck, why would any material gain, why would any gift why would longevity of life be greater in our value system than the offer of salvation given to us, offered to us as a free gift not to be earned? Father, I would pray that you would watch over and all of the Christ followers in the room, may they look through and analyze and debate and then come to the conclusion that their value system is where it should be. If their value system is not where it should be, dear God, I would ask that they go home, think, comprehend, restore. Dear God in heaven, allow this time to be one where we look through and honestly ask ourselves, what do we consider the most important agenda we can pursue and allow us then to have a well-lived life pursuing a correct agenda. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.